Thank you, choir. If we do nothing else in this life, let's thank the one who gave it to us. So beautiful. I love that. I felt like I was uh, uh, in the tunnel, ready to come out for the big game, and you guys, you guys were holding the banner with that song, and I tore right through it. I really, I really appreciated that song. Uh, thankfulness. Thankfulness towards God for all he's done. Let's pray. God, we are so thankful for who you are and what you've meant to us. God, we're thankful that we can participate in the great work that you're doing. We're thankful that you are even mindful of us. God, we thank you. We thank you so much. Amen. So I got a sermon title today called Reaching the Nuns, and this came out of annual conference. Uh, it's nuns, N-O-N-E-S, okay? Uh, not N-U-N-S. Some of those might need to be reached, too. But I was, uh, the Bishop, Bishop Sally Dick preached at annual conference that... Uh, that uh, the fastest growing religious group in America, the fastest growing religious group in America are the nuns. Uh, you may not have heard of that religion, but if, if people are asked on a census, you know, to click to check their religious affiliation, the box that gets checked more often than not is none. No religious affiliation. And what's really striking is that the, that the people who are checking that box grew up here in this church, in the church. So the fastest growing religious group in America are people who, who have been churched when they were younger, but then for some reason they decided now that uh, it's either irrelevant or something they can't, no, can no longer be a part of. Even when she began talking about this, immediately I could think of nuns in my life. Can you think of nuns in your life? People who grew up in church but now are no longer a part of it, that when you ask them their religious preference, it's not that they wouldn't be religious, but they just simply wouldn't identify with any one religion. They would call themselves nuns. I bet you all can think of that. I know you all can think of it because I, uh, each year, Karen Friedendahl and I, as, as our membership secretary, we go through the list of Hilltop members, all 295 of them, and we see names on the list that we're like, what happened to them? Where did they go? What did we do wrong? What happened? And there, many of them are related to you. Your nieces, your nephews, your sons, your daughters, your grandkids, your brothers, your sisters. So I had a great week, though, today, because I thought uh, uh, the, bishop gave, the bishop gave her cabinet homework when, before she preached the sermon. She gave the cabinet, all the district superintendents were told to go and ask the questions that are listed in your bulletin. You'll see them later on the screen, too. To go and ask the questions, like, how would you describe yourself religiously or spiritually to the nuns in their life? To just listen, to just stop and listen to these questions. If you went to church when you were younger, what was the turning point? What did you... Why did you quit altogether or stop attending regularly? Or what disappoints you about the church? When have you seen church at its best? Or what would you wish to tell the church? Just, just to ask those questions. So I got on Facebook, and I thought of, I thought of some nuns in my life, and I, I said, could I, could I ask you to answer these questions? And then I also just put it out there for anybody who I, I just said on my Facebook, if, if you grew up in church but now no longer attend, would you be willing to ask these questions? I had a ton of friends, some that I don't even know, that, uh, that wanted to answer. They were dying to answer. Let me give you one answer. Uh, this guy is actually in church today, and he said I could t tell you that. Uh, and he an this is his answer to question two. If you went to church when you were younger, what was the turning point, and why did you quit altogether or stop attending regularly? He says, short answer, I became independent, and it became my decision. Long answer... Since I was young, I never really enjoyed going to church. I would spend most of my time daydreaming and looking around the church, imagining what it would look like to hang from the upper light fixtures like Spider-Man. <laughs> or try to figure out how, the change, how they change a light bulb in the tall ceilings. Though I did not enjoy Mass, I was still forced to go every Sunday. And when I, when I got to be about 16 or 17, I was allowed to go to church on my own accord. There were three Mass times. Late Saturday, early Sunday, and not so early Sunday. In which case, I would pick the not so early Sunday. Drive around for an hour, go pick up a church bulletin when Mass ended, and then head home and give the bulletin to my parents as proof that I went. Today, you got a real bulletin. You got a real bulletin. <laughs> my understanding of church is that its, its basic design is to, one, give celebration to the Lord and to show him or her appreciation for what he, she has given, 
and to teach a new lesson. I understand that God loves me. He sh she should know that I love him, her as well. I do not understand the need to dedicate one day time to celebrate him or her. It should be an everyday thing. I may not express this feeling verbally by singing a hymn out loud with a group or mentally reading a scripture page, but God should know I love and appreciate him or her because God knows me. As for learning something new, so far I have not. I have never experienced the aha, well, that's something new moment. For me, it's been the same lesson over and over again. He loves you. You should love him. You sin. You're going to sin. He forgives you. Find the ones that need love. Love them back. Pretty good message right there. I had about eight people respond to these questions. They absolutely were intrigued that, uh, that they had a chance to respond, that someone would want to know. It's really, it's really pivotal that we know what nuns think about us. We'll never reach them unless we listen to them. Isn't that true? I wonder if you can think of a nun in your life, if there's someone who immediately came to mind. You have an index card. I'd like you to take one of our new hilltop pens that are sitting in the pew in front of you, and I'd like you to write the name of that one person, or maybe it was two, or maybe it was three, or maybe you can think of five like that. Write the name on that card. I'm asking you to do some homework. I'm, right now, I'm asking you to do some homework, <laughs> some church work. Would you write the name on that, one of your index cards, just one of your index cards? The other one will be for something else. Write the name of those nuns. I'll give you about 30 seconds. If you're like me, many names came to your mind, but there might be one that you've always been hoping would return back to the church. I'd like in the middle, and while you're thinking about that name, I'd like you to hear what Jesus calls us to in Matthew chapter 9. Beginning in verse 35, Then Jesus went out to all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, curing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. We know the harvest is plentiful because it was nothing for us to write something down on that card. We know there are so many people that long and need to know Jesus. We know the harvest is plentiful, but what's the few, the few part, are the laborers, the ones willing to listen to them, the one willing to hear them and talk to them and share their own faith journey with them. And so Jesus says, you know what you should do, disciples? You should pray for those. And you should pray that God would raise up laborers. So if I'm the choir side right now, I'm looking at my person and I'm like, and I, I want to be a good disciple, so I pray, God, raise someone up on the dove side to reach the person on my card. And if I'm on the dove side, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, I want to be a faithful disciple, so I will pray that God would raise up laborers, preferably over there in the choir, that they, that they would reach this person on my card. And if I'm in the middle, I'm glad that Pastor Fred didn't use me as an example. But the truth, the truth is, listen to this, Jesus tells the disciples to pray that God would raise up people for the harvest. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest, to send them out. Chapter 10, then Jesus summoned his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to cure every disease and every sickness. These are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon also known as Peter, and his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon, the, Can the Canaanian, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out 